So we have meeting minutes from the August 7, 2013 meeting. It looks like we also have minutes in our packet from the July 3rd, 2013 meeting. <laughs> no, Are we supposed really. to? And the June 5th as well. And the June 5th. Are we approving all of these or are we just approving the one that's on the agenda? I would say that's just approved to about the seven. Chair Patterson. It's it, <laughs> you like that. Um, I, I talked to the town attorney about this and he says because we did not um, post this on our agenda that he would prefer that we wait to approve the June and July minutes until the next meeting. Okay, so let's just do the August 7th meeting minutes. Uh, any changes to the minutes as presented? Move, no. move to approve. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Uh, approval minutes of the August 7, 2013 minutes, uh, uh, August 2013 meeting uh, are approved. Uh, next we'll go to Citizens Forum. Ms. Perkins, has anybody signed up to speak under Citizens Forum? Uh, no, not at this time. Okay. Would anybody like to speak under Citizens Forum? If none, we'll move on to agenda item number 8A, which was moved in behind 6. And this is a matter from the Planning and Zoning Committee. Discussion on possible amendments to the C1 Neighborhood Commercial Zone and C2 General Commercial Zone for agricultural use. Uh, I believe um, Commissioner Garcia, did you get the chance to review no, these? Okay. Uh, Justin, did you have a copy for? I did give a copy to him. Commissioner Garcia? Okay. I have a copy for the uh, town attorney as well. Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Lee and I were discussing uh, whether there should be language allowing accessory structures uh, to this permitted use, i.e. corral or barn. Sh should that be part of it? There's other copies if anybody wants to see these up here. So let's see, just for the general public, what we have is a... Um, we have a proposed ordinance. Uh, it's drafted in the form of an ordinance. Uh, and from this point, we'll go ahead and discuss some of the language that's in this proposed ordinance. This is a this is a ordinance that would make a change to the development standards in the C1 and the C2 zone. Um, in the C1 zone, we would be allowing limited agricultural use. Uh, and that has a limitation on livestock, a limitation on hoofed animals, a limitation on small fowl. Uh, uh, and then we have a change to the uh, C2 zone, making the same allowance for limited agricultural use. And the, the term limited agricultural use is defined in the current LUBC. Uh, so this would be a change uh, to the C1 and the C2 zone. Uh, to allow limited agricultural use as a uh, permitted principal use. And I think we can go on and have any discussion that needs to play, take place. M Mr. Chairman? Yep. I, I did have, I haven't looked at this yet, but my question is, um, I know there was a, a directive and, and I appreciate yourself and uh, Justin to volunteer to put something together, but have have the town attorney reviewed this as well? Well, we, we couldn't get it on the agenda for purposes of a vote anyway, because it was it was a discussion that took place pretty late. So, I think what we're doing today is just discussing the idea of of putting this in, and obviously there's going to be some potentially considerable differences that could go in it. So, I don't think the town attorney's um, has reviewed it yet, obviously, uh, <clears throat> unless he received it with some from somebody besides myself. Um, but that being the case, I think we need to discuss, you know, the process of approving this. If we were, we'd probably go through another preliminary hearing, and then after that, we'd get a final approval after that. So, uh, With that, Mr. James, would you weigh in on that, in terms of uh, as this ordinance moves forward, what steps it needs to take? 
Well, to answer the first question, I got this about 30 seconds ago, so now I haven't had a chance to review it at all. Uh, having looked at it briefly, uh, I got some serious issues with it. And uh, third of all, it just needs to, uh, since this hasn't been noticed up at all, it's going to need to start with the regular process of, of uh, a proposed amendment to the code, which then has to go to council with all the accompanying bells and whistles, the two hearings here, et cetera, et cetera. So remind us again how, so we can bring this up for discussion tonight, and beyond that, we would put it on next month's agenda? We can certainly right. discuss the, uh, discuss it, yeah, and if we can, uh, we can certainly, there's plenty of time to advertise it for next, next month's regular meeting. And, uh, and the proposed, um, Ordinance making a change to the LUDC would be a preliminary public hearing, a final public hearing, and then town council? Correct. Okay. So okay. I think we could basically make the decision tonight to, to put this or request that this be put on the agenda for next month's meeting. And within that month's time, uh, it would be uh, a good time to address any concerns that Mr. James would have. Mr. James, would you mind? Telling the council what concerns you would have with this ordinance as presented? Well, they're no different than the last time we discussed this. Uh, um, on the issue of, of having animals defecate in uh, commercial zones, which is certainly those which butt up against residential zones, uh, creates large problems. Uh, an enforcement and a number of complaints that are generally are likely to be generated and second of all we're going to have to take a look at this as to whether or not this uh, this so changes the C1 zone that uh, that it merges with another zoning category that we already have um, we have a bunch of agricultural zones and when you start to when you start to uh, to make this sort of a change, uh, you have to be careful that, that we're not obviating uh, the existing C1 and C2 zone and basically uh, taking it out of existence. Uh, I don't know, I'm not generally familiar with commercial zones that allow for raising farm animals. <coughs> and so those are the problems. That, the overall one is what it does to the to the to the general zoning relative to C1 and C2. Whether it, there's enough of a distinction between that and agricultural zones, and then from an enforcement point of view, when you start to bring animals into commercial zones that abut uh, residential neighborhoods, uh, it creates a lot of enforcement questions. Those are the concerns. Thank you. Mr. Lee, do you want to respond to some of those? I think those were some issues while this is being drafted. Uh, well, they were, certainly. Um, I think uh, particularly the, the defecation issue and the butting up against other zones, um, I think I want to address, particularly in subsection 4 of the J, uh, either under 4-13.2 or under 4-14.2, both of them. Uh, what it says is no livestock or fowl shall be allowed on any parcels of less than five acres. So if you have a parcel uh, that's less than five acres, you cannot have any livestock at all. You cannot have any fowl at all either. So that kind of eliminates that, that one issue for Mr. James. And I think Where is that? it's, um, it's J4. Thank you. And I think the other issue uh, to address that particular comment um, is in number one, actually. So it's J1. It says that uh, no livestock pens, fowl pens, or other intensive ranching or agricultural uses uh, considered uh, incompatible with commercial development shall be located uh, any closer than 100 feet of a property line, water course, or acequia. So it, it makes it ensures that the uh, that if there are livestock that fit within that five-acre requirement, that they're certainly 
not within 100 feet of a property line. I think those are the, uh, the comments that I would have to address the issues raised by Mr. James. Would it, uh, Mr. Chair, would it help if, um, if this was uh, controlled via conditional use permit, where each property would have to come for a conditional use permit for this use? That way we would know whether there would be any, any danger of those concerns materializing, as, as opposed to just a blanket permitted use. I don't know if it would help or not. I, I mean, I got to go back to the, uh, the definitions. I mean, we have uh, an agricultural land use uh, definition already. Um, I mean, it takes a while to go through these and try to figure out if it's consistent with the definitions. Um, I think that uh, the last time we discussed this, I indicated that I'm law, the, the town attorney's office would be more comfortable with something along the lines that you just described, some sort of annual permit. Uh, dude, I'm working here. It's over. Are you done? All right, I guess I have, I'm in the construction zone here, so I'll uh, defer my comments until I've had a chance to thoroughly review this. Although, generally speaking, uh, some kind of uh, specially permitted approach, uh, my first impression of it is it would be preferable to a permitted principal use. So, if we could, I think we could do two things between now and next month. Uh, I think one, we could put this on the agenda so that it becomes um, a noticed item that we can discuss and take action on. And then number two, if there's, um, uh, Mr. James, I'd like to request that uh, that we take a shot at this and have a, um, basically a, a legal review from your standpoint, uh, which would be a suggested path to either proceed with this, modify it, or um, put us on the track to taking action on it. All right, I, and I understand that, and I appreciate the, the chair's offer to do that. Um, in order to, to have something in front of the commission that, that you can act on, the next meeting is going to have to be advertised in advance, which means this is essentially a two-week project. And uh, I'm a one-person office, and I'm sort of up to my elbows right now, and annexation issues and E911 issues, it is going to be very difficult for me to do that. I will try, but I, I'll just tell you that I don't know I'm going to fit it in. It may have to wait a month. I didn't work on it uh, between the last time this came up and now because I didn't think that uh, the agricultural uses are something that we're concerned about in October, November, December, January, February, and Powell's. So I, I don't know that it's if the, it's going to be difficult to do, I will try. Um, I'm not sure that it's, that this change, given the fact that we've already uh, said that we're not going to prosecute anybody for violating the existing code because of gardening or temporary farming uses, it may be that we'll have to ask for more time. Would this be something that, uh <clears throat> that in a shorter period of time, instead of asking you to uh, rewrite and give an opinion on, uh, that you might be able to uh, help give us just a little bit of guidance in terms of what your concerns are? Is it something we could, if we could meet for an hour or two and find out what your concerns are and have time to uh, make revisions to this before our next meeting? Well, I'd certainly be willing to do the meeting. It's uh, the drafting that becomes a problem, and the drafting with the notice period and the fact that we use a newspaper that only publishes once a week and they have a long advance notice before you can have access to them, it really does. Even though it seems like it's a month between meetings, uh, it's actually seven to ten working days between this meeting and the time that we need to publish this for action in October. 
And in order to publish it, we're going to have to have a document that's ready to go, and that's really a short time frame. Mr. Chairman? Since, you know, the comments that uh, Mr. James has indicated and so forth, uh, is there an urgency that we need to, I, I'd like to get this going forward and, and get something done, because we did uh, uh, acknowledge to the, the group that was here that something would be looked at and we just don't want it to get lost in the process. But is 60 days um, something that maybe everybody would be agreeable to? Is that something, Mr. James, that will give you ample time, or? Well, we can do that, yeah, we can or, do. Again, 60 days turns out to be closer to 42 days. Yeah, I, I'm just asking how much time you think you would need. And I, uh, I'd, be, I'd be very happy to try to get this done in time to be advertised. Uh, uh, this is a September meeting for the November meeting as opposed to for the October meeting. That's more realistic. I don't want to promise you guys stuff that I just can't do, and I am just buried alive right now. Hey, Doug, is there anything the public want to speak? Um, let's see. Any other comments from commissioners on this? If none, is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on this? You don't have to. But. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to see it keep moving. And I think it's just too easy to kick it down the road two months at a time. So if we could, if we could, I'd like to, I'd like to at least just request a meeting with Mr. James to tell us your concerns, and if we can, if we can start to address those concerns, and if we can start to, um, you know, uh, let the members of the town council know this is coming, maybe we can begin to talk to them about it so it doesn't become a surprise. And I'd like to kind of keep it on the agenda and keep it moving down the road, um, even if it ends up being, even if this ends up being the one that we put out to public notice. For our next meeting, uh, I think that's fine, but I think we keep it on the agenda and, and keep it moving in some period of time. So I'd like to see, I'd like to see the draft of this set out for public notice, and I'd like to see it on next month's agenda. Um, and if we have revisions or concerns about it, I'd like to just see us do our best to address them between now and next month. And if we can't, if we can't work out the kinks by the next meeting, then we can always take it. Continue it on to the next meeting after that. Yeah, but I'd like to see it keep moving. Um, I don't think we have to take a vote on that. Uh, it wasn't on the agenda as a formal action item, um, but we will request that it be on next month's agenda as an action item and be noticed so that we can take action. I would like to say Okay. Mr. Cunningham, would you like to? You have to, you have to, you have to step up here if you're going to speak in a public meeting. You have to step up to the <laughs> microphone and give us your full name. You're on TV. Smile. You don't know what you do what I'd normally do on TV. <laughs> Welcome to our meeting. I don't think we need to swear you in. Yeah. No, my name's Roy Cunningham. I'd just like to thank the commission for looking forward as well as backwards as to what this community used to be. Because we used to be able to take care of ourselves. And by God, some dipshit with a freaking gun shoots out one wire now and this place is paralyzed and we got nothing. Mm, I think the direction that's headed here is good. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay. With that, I think we can move on to agenda item number seven. Matters from staff. Ms. Perkins? Um, we have a presentation by League Partners, and I don't know, have you been able to... Okay. Um, Lead Partners is going to provide, um, hopefully, to a PowerPoint presentation, um, a draft of what they're presenting for the 2013 updated community economic development based strategic plan, which would become a, a, an element of the comprehensive plan. And they're also providing a draft action plan. Um, and so they want to present that and get your comments on it and I need a login here.
Sounds good. I asked him if he would sell me a, a plate of fajitas. Okay. He wouldn't. <laughs> How did you do that? Uh, they're catering to some URM building. Yeah, I was starving and seeing all that food. some chips and salsa. Mine cost three twenty five. Mine cost three twenty five. Well, for the whole time. Yeah. Monster, no This is my unit of ski, I decided. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, but last year it was okay at all. So, I also bought a pass called Epic Pass. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a hell of a deal. Do you already buy your Epic Pass? Mm-hmm. For this year? Yeah. The cutoff date was the second. Uh, was second, yeah. Yeah, and I have friends, I have friends in, uh, I mean, one friend that has a place in Beaver Creek at the, at the Ritz, and at the Ritz in Lake Tahoe, so I'm definitely going to ski. So are we experiencing a technical problem? Somebody want to just give us an overview of the presentation, or what do you think? Well, I'd like to ask if you could possibly move on, and hopefully we're going to get this. Our, our next agreement. item is adjournment. <laughs> There's nothing else to discuss. Anybody know the password for the AV system? <laughs> oh, we do have the PDF on, on the screen. Well, Martha, we do have. Do you, want to, do you want to move on to 7B? Yeah. Okay. I don't. I don't. Okay, let's go 7B. Okay, we'll move on to 7B. It's going to be a short one, I think, though. Right. <laughs> um, basically, what I wanted to let you know is that the, that the Planning, Zoning, and Buildings Department is looking at um, code changes to try and make this town a little bit more business friendly. And some of the things that we're considering as far as code changes are um, 
not having the certified mailing, although there may be a requirement for rezoning within 100, um, within 100 feet of the, the adjacent property owners within 100 feet. We'll have to look at that. But for a general um, application, as far as this preliminary hearing and then the final hearing, there's a requirement to um, do notice, and the notice requires certified mailings. Um, what we're proposing is just to do a regular mailing to the property owners within 300 feet. There is a requirement to post on the property. Um, I'm looking at ways that maybe the town could help by having a standard um, sign that people can use um, to post on the property. Um, we're also talking about possibly removing the preliminary hearing and making that instead the um, departmental review committee hearing as that preliminary hearing. The DRC hearing is already open to the public, but just replacing that um, with the, as the preliminary hearing and then have a final hearing um, because there's notice that's required for both of those hearings. So if not that, lo looking at the notice re requirements, um, if the decision is to keep those two hearings. I don't know what the history has been behind those hearings. Um, we have this annexation that's going to be occurring, and um, to have two hearings on each one of those rezonings that will come in with the annexation will be somewhat onerous, I, I believe, for the commission and then for the council. Um, so we're looking at streamlining some of that and just, you know, to make the town more business friendly. Um, home occupations, trying to simplify that process. That should just be a registration process according to the state statute. All that's um, required by the business is their CRS number to show that they're paying gross receipts tax. I believe currently that the way that we're doing business is we're requiring a lot more up front, and I want that just to be a registration process. Once we get businesses registered, then we can talk about possible improvements as far as getting inspections and whatnot. Um, and um, we have some big items that we're looking at as far as um, rezoning the airport and the airport master plan. And then we have tonight where we're looking at the economic development component of the comprehensive plan and updating that element. That actually is the comprehensive plan is your master plan for future planning. And that should be provide the foundation for your zoning and, and other things that you will be, you know, other projects that will be becoming before you. So that's actually an important longer term planning issue that we need to have your input on. I believe the last time I came here, the town mayor was here and you voiced interest in having more participation in long term planning. And so tonight is, is, is an opportunity to give some of your input. Um, this, again, is an overview. It's not limited to tonight. It's a, it's a public meeting to get input. Um, and then also tonight um, was brought forward a discussion item about gardening in a commercial zone. And, um, and I believe that you have some interested people on the commission that want to move that forward. And then um, we need to talk about adopting a zoning map. We are going to wait for the annexation to go through to bring you the zoning map, but that needs to be adopted too on a, on a regular basis. So those are some of the highlights of some of the things that the, the department is looking at. Um, I welcome your input, things that you think could be improved with the current um, processes and with the current code. Um, I've only been here a month. Um, you know, I'm doing a lot of current planning. I haven't had a lot of time to read through the code. A couple things have popped out, you know, just in the process of trying to provide people um, with my input and my interpretation of the code and the day-to-day -day operations. So I welcome any input and any input that the public might have as far as uh, possible code changes or, um, you know, perceived better ways of doing business in our office. Thanks a lot. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Um, when you say that uh, uh, there will be a DRC in lieu of the preliminary hearing, is that, that on on all applications, you know, variances, uh, uh, conditional use permits, special use permits? 
is it is it what we were always after and we called it streamlining is that what we're trying to accomplish yeah you can call it streamlining um the actual like the conditional use permit special use permit uh rezoning uh, or, or variance, or variance. I mean, most of those require the two hearings right the preliminary hearing and then the final hearing so in what I'm thinking of is in lieu of a preliminary hearing to have the the departmental review how, how as much a time public between, hearing. How much time between DRC me meeting slash preliminary hearing and the final hearing? Is it still going to take up uh, that much time or is it more condensed, which is the whole purpose for doing it? I think we can make it more con condensed and just by yeah. taking out that one meeting with a 15-day notice period, um, should condense quite a bit. I think it's amazing how we can get things done when, when the town becomes the cups customer with its all its annexations and as you called it onerous. Well, I, I also am looking it. for I mean for we've been after it for two years and now <laughs> the town is the customer. Okay. Great. I, I it just happens to coincide. I think regardless we would be requesting to do this. Right now the department is so small I mean, I personally have a vested interest in just making it easier it. Um, for everybody involved. It will be a win-win, not only for the applicant, but for the staff as far as processing applications. We certainly welcome it. I mean, we've been pushing for it for God knows how long, over two years at least. So that's, that's a direction that I'd like to go. Thank you. And I think one of the big improvements is, is that I've noticed on the website, one, the, um, the DRC meetings are posted on the website. Um, and there's an agenda in meeting minutes, right? So I think I think just the the step of formalizing that DRC meeting to a point where there's a record of it um, allows us to treat it as a public Brother. meeting, and a uh, and the DRC meetings happen every Thursday. So uh, uh, as far as I can tell, you know, as long as something happens at a DRC meeting before it comes to a final public hearing, which is only once a month, then you have the opportunity. You could shorten it as short as one month. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, are we ready for a presentation? Are we looking to God? <laughs> seeking, seeking intervention? It's the original flat screen. Flat screen. We can. The, just the as problem a, is a lot of the charts and the data. overall introduction. Are the charts and the data also in this document? They are, but I don't know that they're going to be convenient for you to locate. Okay. I wouldn't mind having it just to read for a week or so before. So, yes. Chairman Patterson, it looks like um, what we'll have to do is I'll move my laptop up to there. You're not going to be able to see it very well, but you still have an idea of what we're talking about. Um, we'll probably be able to flip two steps. 
Should we take it home for a week and read it and come back for a special meeting? Is there a, is there a timing element to you moving and this on? Uh, there is. Okay. Um, there is a work session for town council next Tuesday, and then there's supposed to be an adoption on the phone. Is it something that has to be passed by us in order to go on? You have to, yeah, because it's amending your comprehensive plan. If it's by ordinance, then don't we have to notice it and have a preliminary hearing and a, and a final hearing with a yeah. recommended adoption? Since it's this is by ordinance, that would only be changes to the code. That would actually be administered by planning design commission. Well, it's not really shown as an action item. It would be a Brian James question or something. Brian, we need a legal opinion here. Excuse I me. I don't think I've seen him give one yet at a meeting. <laughs> would you guys be willing to come for a special meeting? I would, I would, the day after? I would yeah. come back if we need to. If it, yeah, if let's, so we get the full benefit of it. Let's just have a special meeting tomorrow. Work out the kinks. What's the question? M Matt Spriggs is um, recommending that this go before the, the commission tonight as the, an element to the comprehensive plan. And the comprehensive plan was adopted by ordinance. So he says that we need to have the commission's recommendation to bring this before the council next Tuesday. Um, my understanding was that this was just going to be a discussion item and a discussion item at the council meeting so that we did not have to adopt it as, as an ordinance type item. Um, but I need your legal opinion on that. Well, it's going to have to be that if the original plan was adopted by ordinance, this is going to have to follow the ordinance procedure to, to amend it. I don't think we published anything for tonight's meeting for an adoption. So no, I haven't, and we haven't noticed it, and that's, that's the problem. Well, it's going to have to move from the September 10th meeting. There's no way. Well, there you go. And we don't have time to have a special meeting, notice that up, and publish. We just don't have enough days. So it can only be a discussion item? Yes. Yeah, I gave an opinion at the meeting. Well, the code um, has a process for adopting ordinances, and we have a responsibility to follow the code. It's a big document. I'd like the opportunity to read it. Is this considered an ordinance, though? The amendment uh, amended, is going to be considered amended. an ordinance, and uh, this is an extremely fundamental document to all future uh, planning and zoning decisions. This is not just a plan to put on a shelf. This is a the fundamental document to which a court looks to gauge any future zoning action uh, by relative to whether it fits into the comprehensive plan. Um, so this needs extremely careful review and it needs to be handled just as an ordinance uh, would be handled and that means we're going to have to notice it up and we're going to have to uh, to follow all the procedures and I think it does matter what this what this commission says relative to the process that's in the code. So I'll, I don't know that there's any urgency in having the comprehensive plan amended uh, in the next 30 days. I would just assume if we're going to err, we need to err on the side of caution because when it comes to challenges to our zoning decisions of this group and later of the council, this uh, comprehensive plan 
is the foundation upon which those are reviewed. But I do think it's good to get public input on it. There you go. I move to table. You know, with that said, I'd like to I'd like to re I'd like to uh, read it and bring it back. Note if it's if it's got it has to be noticed as an ordinance. Um, notice it for our next meeting um, and bring it back for a presentation. Um, is this also if we're trying to get public input? Is this um, is this in a place where the public can access it? Yes. Yes. Posted on the town website. This is posted on the town website. Okay. So I think that could go out with that could go out with our public notice, Ms. Perkins. So the draft is available on the town website for review. Yes. And then uh, and then uh, put it on next month's agenda. Yes. So move to table. Um, okay, then move on. I want to have a discussion. Oh, okay. 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 It's a discussion item. Well, you made a motion, so move it. Um, I don't, it's not an action item on our agenda, so okay. I don't think we're t we'll take action on it. So, okay. Yeah. So since we're here, we're all here anyway, can somebody clarify if we are going to approve something uh, to move forward in town council? Uh, what I'm reading is page, pages 53 through 72 of uh, the documents submitted to us, which is the uh, State of New Mexico's 2010 Local Economic Development Act, are we approving that to go forward? Or are we approving the entire document? Or are we approving the Local Economic Development Ordinance, which is 4.20.020? All those items are illustrative. Those are appendices that are illustrative. You have, you have two documents. Yep. You've got the 2010 Foundation Plan, which set the strategy forward for economic development okay. that was approved in October of 2010. Was scheduled to sunset in June of 2011. The sunset was lifted. The town secured funding and then uh, executed a contract with us to forward it. Now, what's coming forward is an addition to that existing foundation plan, which is an action plan, because there was really no public process done in the original foundation plan. So we've reaffirmed the base direction in the foundational plan with the public and then taking it further in terms of the public determining what actions it feels are the highest priorities going forward in terms of economic development as well as our own professional recommendations as have come both from the work groups and all the input that we've had from that and the data that we've analyzed. So um, in terms of land use, this doesn't necessarily direct any particular land use action, however, you know, fundamentally, your economic development will affect your land use because you're you're looking at the types of companies, et cetera, that you would be focused on trying to attract and trying to grow in your community. So it does have impacts. And so Mr. James, I think, is advising you well that this needs to be done very carefully. So I'm going to put down again here for a second. If, what are we actually going to approve at the next meeting? 2013 House Economic Development Action Plan? Yes, and also the update, <clears throat> the 2013 update to the foundation plan, because there, that original 2010 plan has been updated with more current information and um, also acknowledging what progress or non progress has occurred in specific areas, places that have, um, that are no longer relevant, um, such as, you know, not having to pursue the FAA sign off on the record of decision to put in the Crossman one way. That's a, that's a done decision. Now the question is funding and construction. So it's not necessarily relevant to talk about that 20 plus year project in the making, but talking about the execution of it. So that's the sort of thing that would be approved in the update. Um, but the 2013 action plan uh, makes some commitments not only by the town, but it's asking for commitments and the ability for the town to leverage commitments from the region because this is really a regionally based plan. We can't do this as a 5,000 population town trying to wag a 32,000 population county and thinking we're going to have an effect. So it's more affirming a, a desire to 
create the public park and public and private partnerships necessary in order for this to get underway. And that, that action plan is from page 72 on. There are two different documents. You should see two different documents. That those both should have been provided to you. The beginning of the 2013 Strategic Action Plan mm -hmm. looks like it starts on page 77. Okay. It, they may have commingled it into a single document. They are actually provided as two separate documents. So I'm not can sure how they were provided to you. Please do. Show you Please do. Go ahead. Can you go ahead and... This is the update. Okay. So that's what we see here. Right? That's a 2010 interim plan that was updated. Okay. So that's what we have here, right? And that says pages that goes through 72. That's 72 pages. Okay, so we have one part of our document. The first part looks like it's 72 pages. And then after 72 pages, the 2013 strategic action plan is the second document. Yes. Okay. Uh, and we're approving the 2013 Strategic Action Plan. And the, and the update. Two different documents. Okay. So we're approving both of these documents. Right. And it's actually not an approval necessarily. We'll it's a for recommendation call. for the council in terms of what their action should be okay. from the perspective of the commission. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I think we move this on to next month's meeting and notice it properly. Um, we'll have to ask Ms. Perkins to discuss that with Mr. Rodriguez because our contract ends at the end of September. Ms. Perkins, you'll be presenting this at our next meeting? Yes, I believe I will. You know, I was, I was, I put this on the agenda as a discussion item because I realized that this needed to follow the requirements for an ordinance. And, but I do think it's important that we err on the, in obtaining as much public input as we have. It's my understanding that LEAD Partners has tried to reach out to the public, and I was hoping that they would give at least a brief summary of, of what the process has been and how, how they arrived at what, what they're presenting tonight. I don't know that he's, that Matt has provided you with any sort of background. Matt, can you describe a little bit more about what you were, attempted to do and, and what you and give us a summary of, of what the plan is uh, yeah certainly the the whole thing hinged off of the fact that while the original plan was the basis for a strategic plan it in and of itself was not a strategic plan because it hadn't forwarded and had not garnered support for any particular actions to be undertaken. It was more of a statement of fact and generalized direction in terms of what the community from staff's perspective was wanting to pursue in terms of future economic development. So when we received the contract, we started with a kickoff meeting in February, and actually we held two of them. Um, in which there was good turnout from the public, uh, two vastly different audiences depending on the evening. And we discussed with them basically what we were forwarding and in the process we were going to be undertaking, which was quite much, quite a bit larger originally when there was more staff um, for the town because the town was going to be taking on a bigger role in terms of production of items. Um, when Matt Foster left and when Mr. Perea was also subsequently left, um, we simply realized that there wasn't any capacity in the town to do what needed to be done on the town's behalf. So we talked with Mr. Rodriguez and we moved the scale back and we're still proceeding with an action plan. We still were able to achieve what we were wanting to achieve, which came after we had the negotiate that between February and May when we did the economic uh, development transition roundtable and that was a group of was it 14, 13. 13, 13 local leaders um, speaking about the economy from personal perspectives and from the idea of where they wanted to go 
what they felt were solutions, um, what they thought there were, were problems too, of course, but we were really trying to focus on that transition. How do we make this change from a tourism-based economy to a more substantial and, and more robust economy that would be able to survive some of these economic changes that we've undertaken since 2006. So after that, there were four work groups that were created um, in four specific focus areas, and those being business retention, expansion, and incubation, which is more about business climate, um, creative industries, which is about the production of art, production of film, um, anything that could be in that creative category, which, of course, there are some, like film, kind of blurs the line between technology and, and creative, but as we were addressing it, it was what's your core product and what does it rely on? If it's relying mostly on creativity, which film, for example, would, we would lump that into the creative industries. Then there was technology, which is both IT-based um, and other forms of technology, mostly around information, though. Um, but also professional and technical services to a certain degree, some portions of that. And then uh, the last one was tourism and retail, uh, looking at tourism from both an accommodations and activity standpoint, but also the retailers who survive off of visitation. So those focus groups, which had volunteer members from the community participating, went through what we call a SMART goal process. What was, um, the, sorry, what was the fourth one? Creative technology, tourism retail, or tourism and retail? Tourism and retail. Tourism and retail is, the, is one. So it's business retention, expansion, and incubation, creative industries, technology, and tourism and retail were the four. That's quite all right. Um, so through those work groups, we ran them through what's called a SMART goal process, where you take a number of generated ideas in terms of what would be good goals in order to be able to improve that particular sector of the economy. What's going to help those businesses? What's going to help the community be able to attract more businesses and grow more businesses locally, as well as retain them? And then they set those priorities by running it through the SMART process, which stands for specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. So all of those aspects have to be fleshed out in order for that goal to really be a goal. Um, saying that you want to build, for example, saying you want to build more trails is not a SMART goal. Saying you want to build a trail from Talpa to the Taos Plaza is getting closer and if you say that you want to use major roadways, et cetera, see what I'm getting to? It's laying out more specifics so that you actually have actionable items underneath that goal. That goal then, of course, is supported by objectives that have to be completed in order to be able to reach that goal. And each one of those objectives have individual actions to them. So it's a pretty lengthy process. Um, we got through a good portion of it with the time that we had. We only had two meetings with each one of these groups. Um, but I would say that it could still use some more refinement, but we have stuff to start with. It's, it's a good starting point. Um, so one thing that became readily apparent from all of the community that participated was, one, both within the private sector and between the public and private sector, the communication and collaboration is horrible. There are very few bright spots where that works well. Taos Tourism Council is often given kudos because they actually collaborate and do joint marketing and it's a number of people who get together without anybody holding a gun to their head. They just do it. Um, but there are more misstarts and lack of that sort of cooperation and collaboration and communication than there are instances of it happening. So that was something that's of great concern. Um, and part of that also is reflected with a lot of concern about trust in terms of what's going to happen next. If this plan gets approved, then is anybody going to execute it? And that came to the second part, which was there is no one entity right now that is solely responsible for doing what is truly economic development. 
Now, it kind of begs the question as to what true economic development is. And without the slide, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to explain to you, but you have two aspects of, your, of any given economy. You have basically an interior aspect in which you circulate local goods and dollars. You're trading, you know, you go to Taos Tire Factory, you buy four tires. That pays somebody's salary, et cetera, and then they buy food with that, et cetera. But all it does is it goes in a circle. It's not new money. It's just taking new money and passing it around until you've actually deteriorated or depleted that dollar's value within your community. So in order for an economy to survive, it needs injections of new money, which is bringing money from the outside into the community. It's exporting goods and services and importing money. That's the basis of any healthy economy, and economic development doesn't focus on that circulation on the local level. A buy-local campaign is not economic development. That's just market capture. That's community development. It's making sure that your businesses receive business from people who live here. That is not economic development. It, it made better businesses, but it does not increase your economy in any way, shape, manner, or form. The way you do that is to focus on those businesses. For example, Seriousware provides software and services out of state and definitely out of our area. And they may even be going to an international scale. I know that there's some discussion about them doing some things in Canada and Mexico as well. So they've expanded greatly. And their services that they provide and their software brings revenue to Taos in the name of profits for the corporation because the headquarters is here. So we see the profits coming in from that. Um, you could also say that our hotels are part of that economic base because they bring people from outside the community. And even though they're coming here to consume the good and service, they're still exporting it because they come, they pay their nightly rental for whatever room they're in, and then they leave. So they come, they bring their money, they spend their money, and then they leave. So there are some businesses, retail businesses, like galleries that are also considered to be base level type economy activity because they, temp they pretty much primarily sell to people from outside the community. The local consumption is relatively small of their goods, but those are a very specialized form of retail. So we examined along with having these discussions in these specific areas, we examined what the economic data was telling us in terms of where we're strong, where we're weak, where we're losing money, where we're gaining money, where we're losing employees, where we're gaining employees. Um, so that sort of mechanism and that sort of focus, what I just talked about, there's no one entity that does that. And it has to be done on a regional-wide basis. It, you, you can't control an economy from within the six square miles of Taos. That's just not possible. So it needs to be Taos County plus the extras of Eagle Nest and Angel Fire, which are in Colfax County, would be included then within that region because they have a symbiotic relationship with our community here in Taos. So given that the town really can't be doing that, the county doesn't have the capacity to be doing it, and thirdly, any particular public entity is the worst possible place to be putting your economic development efforts. Part of it is a lack of confidentiality due to sunshine laws. There can be exceptions, but they're difficult, and Brian would probably have public records requests that he'd have to examine ad nauseum trying to get a hold of somebody's proprietary information if the economic developer were attached to a public entity like the town. So that's a huge issue because you can't gain a corporation's trust if you can't keep their proprietary information safe. So it has to be an external entity. Typically, the most functional regional economic development entities 
are those that are created through public-private partnership. It's a 501c3 or 501c6, depending on the, the situation, that gets created that is then funded both publicly and privately. And their sole focus is growing economic base, looking at economic base jobs. How do we bring more jobs here or create more jobs within our existing businesses and keep them here that bring new money into the system? That is its primary function. And there is no entity currently that does that. And I would argue since TCEDC really shifted focus back in the early 90s, Nobody has been focused on that. Um, to an extent, uh, and his name just fell on my head, there was a gentleman here who was doing that for a while, but it went defunct um, and became ineffective. Uh, John Otis. John Otis, Otis thank you. Um, and he's since moved away. And, you know, in fact, my letter of resignation to the town when I left was stating specifically that this needed to be regionalized. It was very nice of them to hire me, and I really appreciated my job for two and a half years, but I was not going to be capable of doing what needed to be done within the town. It's that simple. So um, that is probably the biggest recommendation that we have coming forward in this, is that there be a consortium of public and private entities that would fund and have oversight over an economic development agency that would be adequately staffed and adequately funded. And the creation of that can actually be funded. We had a discussion with Terry Bruner from Rural Development, and Rural Development has specifically seed money to build organizations like that. They don't provide ongoing funding. They expect you to create the entity and create the mechanisms for it to survive, and then they go away but they do have money in which that can be done. And that would be a public entity that would have to apply for that funding. But given our track record in general in Taos County with rural development, they really like us because we spend their money. They give us money and we spend their money. That isn't something that Terry could say about the rest of the state of New Mexico. They frequently give money and take money back on a regular basis with other communities. That doesn't happen here. Um, everything from the broadband initiative to, you know, smaller things. So there is an avenue in which to make this happen. And that entity would then be focused on making sure that the SMART goals that were developed by these work groups would then get implemented and also working toward a lot of other things that need to be done on a continual basis, updating this plan, um, being responsive to the people who are funding them. And that's been the issue in the past, is that there's never been a public-private entity partnership that's been built here that makes that economic development entity responsible and accountable because they fund it. We've uh, taken a, another look at it, and, and the urgency that's around this is pretty <laughs> stark. If you look, we separated out our base economy in terms of what is bringing in new dollars and looked at what circulates dollars, and right now our economy is shrinking at 2% per annum. That may not sound like a lot, but in 10 years, it's significant, you know, we're, and it could accelerate in terms of that if nothing's done. So that's that's the major gist of the of the plan. So, could, could you just that, that, the, that shrinkage that you're talking about? I thought that, uh, in my perusal of the document, it looked like around a billion dollars a year was what the, was the rough number of the, for commerce. At two percent a year, we're talking how much you know, and how many jobs does that translate into? Or? We've been doing some projections in terms of growth and focusing on those areas which are growing um, and how to best add to the economy. If something's hemorrhaging, it's pretty hard to do anything other than just try and shore it up. I mean, I, 
you know, you, you really want to focus on those areas. And so the areas that are going to be the most significant in terms of being able to stop the bleeding are going to be information, professional and technical and scientific services, and manufacturing, believe it or not. Um, but a very s small subset of manufacturing being personal care product manufacturing, which is actually seeing tremendous growth. Um, those three areas are the areas that are going to be the easiest to grow, and they're all high-skilled, high-paying jobs. And that's, that's the area that we need to go into. Um, there's going to be a certain amount of growth, inevitably, in the accommodations and food services, but you're talking low-skill, low-wage. I mean, you don't want to put a lot of effort into growing that, to be quite honest. You just mentioned the 2% number. I'm just curious what that 2% translates to into the actual... In terms of the actual dollars, I mean... We had what eight hundred and seventy nine thousand or eight hundred seventy nine seven million total gross revenues. Yeah, so yeah, and so yeah, you're talking a couple million bucks. I mean, it's not chump change. Mm -hmm. ten, ten jobs. Yeah, easily, easily. Did you have any other questions, commissioners? Or if there's no other questions, I have a comment. Commissioner Lee. It's a debate. Um, the buy local part, you said it's not economic development. It's not. I fundamentally disagree with that. And the reason I disagree with that is the concept of buying local is an attractive characteristic of a community that attracts people to your community as a tourist. And they see a, a local economy that is buying local and they're showing that they're green and organic and, and, a, and a, a community that takes care of itself and attracts more tourists to that community. So buying local actually indirectly affects your other sectors, such as tourism, building second homes and stuff like that. Well, the second home market is completely in the toilet and doesn't show any sign of revival. Um, we have more housing stock on our MLS now than we ever have before. Um, the prices are now stabilizing, but they're down a great deal. And the other issue is that great, so you bring more tourism in, which increases your accommodations, food services, and retail, which are all low-skill, low-paying jobs. So well, if that is an effect, it's not a very effective one. one. It, well, I, it's not... You know, two really important aspects of our community are both agricultural production and art production, right? We think of ourselves as an artistic community. We also think of ourselves as rural, rustic, and still has an agricultural base, right? Well, guess what? In terms of our total economy, art is 0.7% of our total economy, and agriculture is, and this includes hunting, fishing, and um, recreation um, as well as actual agricultural production and it's 0.5 percent of our overall economy so what we think is our main drivers is not our main drivers it's our community identity it doesn't mean that it's not important but it doesn't mean that you put a whole bunch of time money and effort to make that happen so you're looking in orders of magnitude a buy local campaign is incredibly ineffective from an economic development standpoint. There are marginal residual appearance and possibly community development benefits, but it's not going to affect your base economy. So um, from an economics perspective, a buy local campaign is ineffective and it is not economic development. Um, whereas it is, however, community development. That's where I think you're coming up with it has a community image issue. It has a lot of, you know, a community that doesn't purchase from itself doesn't, tes doesn't tend to socialize with itself either. You know, that's people, if they're clicking away to make their purchases, they aren't making contact with other people in the local community. And so it, it erodes your community fabric. So part of it is, too, is that it is a community economic development plan. But when we are examining it, there has been a lot, a lot of time, money, and effort poured into the community development aspects. 
we have assets way beyond certainly any town of 5,000 in New Mexico, but we have more than probably most of the United States in terms of Youth and Family Center, the Taos Center for the Arts, or the Community Auditorium, rather. Um, those sorts of things aren't something you find in most small communities of this size. There's been a lot of good social fabric put into place. And, you know, look at all of our nonprofits. That's all community development. It is, it is creating a network of both safety and of community, which is not a bad thing. But the one thing that has not been done is growing the economic base. The same level of effort is not apparent, nor has it ever been apparent in this community. However, we're now suffering from that neglect. We have a shrinking economy, and a buy local campaign isn't going to change that. Well, I don't want to, I think what you're explaining is excellent. I, I think all economic development thoughts are amazing, and I think what you put together so far in my brief glance at it, and, and the discussions I've had with all you guys regarding this is amazing, but, you know, you talk about your four, create, your four categories, mm -hmm. business retention, incubation, and then you listed tourism, and you said tourism has a what percentage of our economy? And well, then, tourism is a large percentage of our economy right now. Tourism is huge. It's the art part of it in terms of um, art production, so to speak. Okay. That's writers, uh, painters, sculptors, uh, filmmakers. You know, people who are in that category in terms of next is a very small amount. In terms of accommodations and food services, it's huge. In terms of our base economy, it's 40% in terms of what brings in new money. So it's very important. And we by all means need to continue what we're doing to keep it stable and to keep it happening. But it's not an area that you necessarily want to have strong job growth because it's low skill and low wage. It'd be far better to have new professional technical or scientific services, lawyers, accountants. Um, <laughs> Don't need any more Did lawyers. I really say that? Did I say more lawyers? Um, <laughs> you know, and other people who provide technical expertise, right? People who consult, you know, with the laboratories who live here. Um, people who utilize the laboratories to leverage things to, to bring to market. The information technology. I mean, look at what um, Oban Lambie does. I mean, he's doing some really complex web programming. I mean, the stuff he does is like, I'm, I consider myself fairly technically savvy, but it's way over my head, some of the stuff he does. And, you know, that's, that's a tremendously growing area, and it's high wage and it's high skills. So creating one of those jobs is equivalent to three or four jobs in your accommodations and food services. So, and it's not going to be subject necessarily to people's whims, you know, disposable income. Do I have the money to go to Taos or not? Can I spend the night in El Monte Sagrado or am I in the hotel, Motel 6? You know, I mean, that's, that's the sort of thing that we end up being faced with when we're based on tourism. I mean, God forbid we have a terrible snow year, right? I mean, that's, we can't rely on that. That's why we need to start doing some things to grow these other sectors to get more balance in the community because it's way out of balance right now. So if you were to rank your categories in some kind of most important economic development, if you were to put all your uh, energy into one thing, what would your first thing be? And then can you, can you rank them? Uh, number one would be information. Like information technology? Yeah, essentially, IT. Okay. Number two would be professional, scientific, and technical services. And these are the NAICS code categories and some composites. Okay. Um, and then the business retention, expansion, and incubation stuff that needs to be done. And quite frankly, I think in terms of the creative stuff, all you do with that is shore it up. Just make sure you don't lose it. You know, I mean, you don't want to start hemorrhaging your creative community because that would totally strip Taos of its identity. 
So that's really important to shore that up and make sure it's stable, make sure that those people who are here continue to choose to be here. But actively growing it's going to be incredibly difficult and, and not necessarily very productive in terms of payback for the investment of time and effort and money. So that, that would be how I'd rank those. Okay. But information, professional, technical, and scientific services, that is, those two are really close together in terms of overall impact. Thank you. Oh, actually, I, I would throw one other thing in there. The biggest issue that we have for professional, technical, scientific services as well as IT, workforce. Our workforce stinks. It's awful. Um, we had one gentleman who does high-level accounting and does it mostly outside of Taos. He's a, one of those professional services that's consumed outside of Taos primarily. He's been trying for a year and a half to hire another accountant and can't hire one. Can't get somebody here. Serious where Mark Danman, almost half of his workforce lives elsewhere because he can't get them here. And if he gets them here, they want to leave for various reasons. Most of it revolving around things that are not really in the control of anybody other than the school districts because the number one issue that we keep hearing from candidates is lack of quality education. So part of our issue, too, is that hemorrhaging of the working age. We have, you know, youth is flat. It's not changing. We have a growing demographic in terms of age 54 and over. So near retirement or at retirement is growing. And we're shrinking in the working ages, age 20 to 54. We, we're losing people who are in working age. That's not a good situation because most of those people who move here who are retiring or nearing retirement are going to passive forms of income, meaning, you know, dividends, rents, Social Security, you know, transfer payments. We actually now have more people relying on transfer payments or passive forms of income than actually participating in our workforce. It's about 53% that rely on passive forms of income and 47% that actually work for a living. That is really scary. So I know I sound like Dr. Kevorkian, but if we don't do something, as somebody else said this to me, and I think it's very apropos, if we don't do something, we're going to turn into Mora. Great place, but nobody's there. Anything else from the measures? Um. Matt, thank you for your uh, Cliff Notes version of the sure. presentation. I think it's always, um, uh, you know, I always enjoy your input and your insight, especially in terms of economic development. Uh, I look forward to your full presentation, and uh, it sounds like the proper way to do it is to is to come back in a month and, and give notice so that we can take action on this as an ordinance. Um, hopefully, the town and Mr. Rodriguez will extend your car contract far enough to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, if we needed to hold a special meeting to be able to do that, if we didn't want to wait a month, I think um, Commissioner Luke suggested that before we left. Uh, if you feel like it would move you on, uh, I think I'd be willing to I'd be willing to do that. I don't know if the other commissioners would or not. Absolutely. Um, if that, uh, uh, we, we, can either, we can either pick a date, but I guess we just have to pick one far enough out that we can actually give two weeks public notice for a preliminary public hearing. Is that correct, Mr. James? That's correct. I don't know. Okay, sounds like it's the next regular meeting. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you mind, uh, you brought a few gentlemen with you tonight. Would you mind introducing who they are um, and what their roles have been in this plan? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, Bruce Ross is my partner at Leaf Partners. And then we have our associates, um, Bill Stevens and Dick Schlauerbaum. They've been analyzing the economy of Talus for a long time now. Mm -hmm. um, they're great data resources and I 
dream up what I want them to show me and they do it, which is really a tremendous asset for the community. Um, one of the things that's really unique about New Mexico, as much as I abhor our tax system, um, because we base our taxation on gross revenues to individual businesses, they have to report that and every, yeah, nobody is not subject to that. Everybody reports it, so you know what your business activity is. For those who report, you know that a dollar, hopefully as long as they're being honest. But it's a great measure. No other state in the U.S. really has that tool available, and these gentlemen have been collecting it for years and, and mining it, along with you know, employment data and demographic data as well, because you can't just base yourself off of that. But most states don't have access to that kind of data. So. Um, as much as it's a really different form and not necessarily a positive form of taxation, it gives you great data. We'll say that. Um, you know, I'm sure this document, along with the other economic development documents you've written, are, are, uh, are really well written. I've always enjoyed reading them. I would encourage the other commissioners to read this if we have the time. Um, and hopefully, uh, if we give prior public notice, we'll end up with a little bit better turnout in terms of public participation. Um, and before your next uh, meeting, you should have uh, another draft of the plan, okay. um, which will include things like the executive summary and some other things that we're trying to finish up. Excellent. That's about a 90% draft, so we okay. just have a few things to throw in. There's a little bit of projection work that needs to be done in the executive summary. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor say aye. aye. So moved. <laughs>